Greetings all, Last Outrider here with another fun fact filled 40k video. How are you? <clears throat> this video comes because I have recently shocked people by letting them know I have never seen any of the video series by Eliphaz or uh, the What If the Emperor Had a Text to Speech Device guys. They are shocked. Well, okay. So, when asked what would I think of it, my answer was I've never seen it. So, go see it and tell us what you think. Okay, I will go see it and, and I'll tell you what you think because that's just the guy I am. So, I binge-watched about ten of them. And to, to give the quick answer, I prefer the Eliphaz videos to the text-to-speech uh, videos. That's the first thing out of the way. Um, they're friends, from what I understand, with them making it, so I, I guess that won't bother each other too much. Why do I like the Eliphaz videos? Because they do not attempt to explain the 40K universe. They just spoof it, right? They just add their own text a little bit subtext really to situations that we already know without changing them or explaining them in fact they even go out of their way to sit there and say there is no explanation uh, for some of the things for example the ultramarines defeating the tyranids on mccrack so good job eliphaz the the lore is spot on i have no problem with any of those videos they're funny and well written. Thank you. Now, 90% of everything I just said also applies to the Emperor's text-to-speech device. What's the big difference? The big difference is that the author of whoever's writing the narration there feels the overwhelming urge to mansplain the 40k universe. Don't do that. You know, I, I mean, you get to the point, especially when they bring about Magnus with the 15th Primark episode, where virtually every single episode is just narration of mansplaining. <sighs> Some of it's funny. A lot of it would be funny. Except, well, you know what? It is. Everything that they say there is actually spot-on accurate. There's only one small problem. It's accurate pre-2005. 40K is not how it's represented in those videos anymore and hasn't been for, well, since 2005. And I will go and tell you exactly how why very quickly. If you want me to go into more details, let me know in the spot below and I'll make individual videos on, on, on the differences between uh, pre-heresy novels and uh, post-Horus heresy novels. One, the warp is not how it appears in those videos. And those videos are only four years old when they start talking about the warp and these changes came before that. The warp, uh, previously, the chaos gods, powers, were viewed as the same as the seven deadly sins, like they are presented there. They are good in small doses, and that's how they corrupt you, and then they get you to go to excess and extremes. That's the same way the seven deadly sins corrupted people. Uh, Pride is good on small doses. When it becomes too much, it's bad. Gluttony, sure, everybody enjoys a good meal. When it becomes too much, it's bad. Lust, wrath, uh, uh, envy, sloth, what else? Fuck it. You understand my point. In small doses, it's fine. The problem is when you lose control and it goes too far. And that's what these chaos powers are. 
They're all about excess. And, they, and that's the corruption aspect of chaos. It's excess. An insane excess. That's how you become a worshiper of these chaos powers. You, you become addicted to what they represent. Pre-2005 uh, pre warp and chaos. Afterwards, it's not. Now, very briefly, the warp in in the modern uh, 40k is basically a, 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 a thin, corrupted layer of the immaterium um, that, was, that was corrupted, that touches the material realm. It, 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 it's right up against the material realm. Before you go deeper into the warp, it's, it's the shoals, it's the shallows, it's the surface, it's the meniscus of the warp which has become corrupted because of the war in heaven where the Necrons and the Eldar and the Old Ones and the Satan were all fighting each other. And that's what created this. Uh, we now know that once you pierce that meniscus, once you get into the true warp, uh, it's no longer corrupted. And there are other intelligences there, referred to as Leviathans, that are not cor uh, nothing like the chaos entities. We don't know anything about them. We'll probably find out about them in the Siege of Terra series. That's a change. Uh, what else? The Custodes. I have no idea. Yes, there was a time when the Custodes didn't wear their armor. There was a brief explanation that they stopped wearing their armor due to being in mourning for the Emperor. Uh, but the picture of them, but at that point in time, in the rogue trader days, no explanation was written in stone. And, uh, how do I say this? Okay, let, riddle me this. Name a group that is referred to by a number, like the Custodes have been referred to as the 10,000, right? A group of semi-naked men who wore loincloths, red cloaks, bronze gold helmets, carried spears and a shield, ran around ripped muscle-wise, half-naked, ultimate hand-to-hand -hand apex soldier warrior types in history. Oh, you don't got it? Well, let me tell you. The 300. Whenever I saw the Custodes, and they were the elite bodyguards of the Emperor, I immediately recognized them as being the Spartan-type characters, like Leonidas, which is what the 300 took their, their fashion tips from. It's the exact same thing. Large brass helmets with red horsehair, you know, ponytails and a giant spear and a loincloth and a giant gold brass shield and they were the badasses of hand-to-hand -hand combat, the ultimate warrior types. 40K is filled with ancient uh, warrior civilizations represented due from, from the emperor's past, which we believe he simply reincarnated, if you will, in, into, into the 40K. You know, you've got the, the ultramarines are based upon the Roman legions. Um, the Thousand Sons are based upon ancient Egypt. Does it not make sense that the small, and originally around 500, 3 to 500 of them, uh, were the original numbers of custodes in the Rogue Trader days, were the hand-picked uh, ultimate guardians of, of the Emperor? Wouldn't they be uh, Spartans? <sighs> they look like Spartans to me, is, is, um, 
what I'm trying to say. So I never found it strange that they looked that way. I thought that was obvious, apparently to the authors of this video series, they either didn't know that, didn't recognize that, or, and they turned it into this kind of greased up uh, homoerotic stripper interpretation of the custodes, which quite honestly surprised me. Like I said, I don't know if they didn't know the Spartan reference or they chose to ignore it. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they chose to ignore it for comedy's sake. If they didn't know it, well, then they're just off. Sorry. Now you know! The Custodes were originally based upon Spartans. And if you could, all the jokes that you'd have to make upon them, you'd have to apply to the guys running around in uh, 300. <laughs> um, which doesn't quite work, right? Most people think the 300 were badass, even though they were running around half naked with spears and red cloaks and big uh, helmets on. Oh well. Oh well. So, <clears throat> what else? Um, yeah, the mansplaining. It's, it, it, it's very mansplainish of 40k, old 40k that hasn't been brought up. So let's let's go about also what they talk about as to why, but they have some nice stuff in it too, because whoever has done it knows some of the more esoteric stuff like Ethereal Starn being in the uh, in the in the Black Library, the Laughing God, they they do know some of the the, the detailish stuff like that. But still, that's pre-Horace Heresy novel stuff. That's Warhammer Monthly, Ethereal Stern, you know what I mean? And even Leonidas with the Blood Angels uh, um, quest. Uh, it, 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 for some reason, they didn't incorporate any of the updates from the Horace Heresy. I, it would be a completely different series if they did. Maybe they'll do that in the future. The, 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 other, the other big thing that comes about is why did the... Um, why did the heresy take place? Now we're going to digress a little bit here because I'm going to tell you I'm going to take this time, this time, for those of you who've managed to get to the end of this video are going to hear my prediction for how the Horus heresy is uh, going to change in Siege of Terra. Are you ready? Maybe it'll be worth another video, but I'll just give you a little rundown to it now. Bam! Who caused the Horus heresy? Why did the Horus Heresy take place? Um, what about the uh, Horus 3.0? 3.0. He's been rebooted three times now. Uh, the Primarchs have also all are basically 2.0 at this point. You have their original storylines, and now they all have a new background. Uh, and finally, the Emperor has been rebooted. Um, pretty much a third time as well, too. Uh, the first being the Rogue Trader Emperor, where he actually was a guy. Um, they just didn't give you the details on him, not because they were unknown. That actually comes out with 3rd Edition Codex, um, or 3rd Edition Rules, that they made it unknown as a part of the story. But prior to that, it was known. They just didn't write it down in the rule book. Um, but it was a known figure. So, 40K, ultimately, just like I said in my video four years ago, is going to follow the Frank Herbert Dune novel series. That's how it's going to go. That's how it's going to end. There is a golden path. This is a meme that has also been made popular with Avengers Endgame. There is one path that frees humanity from chaos, from the use of the warp to travel in. There is one path that freed humanity from predestiny and the spice, an addiction to the spice in Dune. None of the movies or television shows really showed spice uh, for what it was. 
and that is basically super crack cocaine, super methamphetamine. Uh, this had positive aspects, but it was ultra addictive. And I'm not talking about, hey, I tried it once and then stopped. No, spice it was is so addictive that even trying it once in a modest amount hooked you for life. And there's no withdrawal. There, there's no getting clean. You stop taking spice, you die slowly and horribly. Period. They leave this out of all the movies for some reason. It's very clearly explained in the book. Paul Atreides looked at spice as just the same way the emperor looks at the warp as just this horrible price humanity needs to pay um, for, for, you know, not using thinking machines, not using AI and computers. Can you see the similarities here? This video is going to get a little long now that I realize this because I really have to dig deep to explain 40K. For those of you who are staying with me, thank you you're going to get some deep 40k understanding. And feel free to share all of these as your ideas with your friends so that when you find out they come true, you can also be <laughs> the Messiah of 40k that predicted how it was going to end years in advance. Anyways, the spice was the scourge of the uh, Dune Empire uh, with drug addicts everywhere dying in the streets, all of the same drug crime that you could imagine in today's world magnified a thousand times by spice being a necessary drug uh, to the Dune Imperium. Okay, like I said, ultra addictive, ultra expensive. It was used in every way you would use on drug addicts in today's world that you can imagine. Um, and Paul wanted to free the Imperium from the spice because it's horrible shite. Well, this is exactly verbatim the concept of, of what the emperor wants to do in, with humanity. He wants to free us from uh, the warp travel. So, uh, where does that bring us to? That means that logically, <clears throat> the same people who were the secret enemies of Muad'Dib in Dune are going to be the secret enemies of the Emperor in 40k. Do you know who they were? If you know Dune, you already know who they are. If you don't know who Dune, I'll give you first hint. Chom Corporation. Don't know that? Okay, I'll just tell you then. The Navigators. They literally have the same name in 40k and in Dune. The navig literally, the Navigator Houses. The Navigator Houses were the ultimate enemy of Paul Atreides because when he rids the universe of spice, of the need for spice, he rids the universe of the need for navigators because the navigators need spice to travel, yes, the galaxy. Well, it's verbatim the same in 40K. When the Emperor opens the webway of mankind, what happens to the navigators? They become useless. Warp travel ceases. They become worse than useless. They become abhuman mutants. And we know what 40K thinks of abhuman mutants. They're not just going to be left alone. They're going to be freaking killed as abhuman mutants. Um, they're not liked now, so you can imagine when they have no purpose how much they'll be hated then. 
Why was, okay, so this goes on to the next major point. Why did the emperor keep the warp a secret? Why did he keep all of these plans a secret from the Primarchs, from the Space Marines, from, the, from all of these people? Why did he just disappear and keep things a secret? I will tell you why. It's not because he didn't trust the Primarchs. It's not because of all of these things. The reason why the Imperial Palace was on lockdown and under ultimate secret is because he was keeping it a secret from the navigators for the most part. He knew that if the navigators found out that his plan was to rid the humanity of the need for warp travel, they would probably rebel. He knew they would rebel, period. And if they stopped flying around the Imperium, then, then uh, that's it. So some, in, in, in sometimes the, the purpose of the Great Crusade, in many ways, was to hide the true intentions of the imperi of the emperor if he just had ships flying out to where he wanted them to go to pick up the relics and artifacts and things that he needed to uh, build the webway then the navigators would know because they're flying the ships so instead he generated this great crusade to unify humanity with everybody flying everywhere hoping then that the navigators would not divine the true purposes of where he wants to go. Where they want to go in the far-flung reaches of the galaxy would just be, you know, one flight amongst millions. You wouldn't be able to discern a pattern. Uh, the reason why everything was so secret and nothing was talked about is because it was, it was, it was, it, it was to be kept secret from the navigators. Uh, and I believe the navigators are the real reason for the Horus heresy. They found out they didn't particularly want to go extinct, so they somehow, they're already warp-capable psychics, they, 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 um, yeah, they made a deal with chaos in some way. Because when you look at the last 10,000 years, the only faction that didn't suffer from the Horus heresy are the navigators, right? Both loyalists and traitors used them. The last 10,000 years didn't bother them at all. They just kept doing what they're doing. How, how were they affected at all in the last 10,000 years? Do they care about wars? Do they care about any of these inquisitions and pogroms and blah, blah, blah? No, no. Did their technology or anything devolve? Do they give a shit about the emperor or, or, or the... Uh, 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 the, the religion or him becoming a god or not becoming a god. They don't care. This didn't affect them in any way, shape, or form. Their lives continued on as normal. 10,000 years in the future as it did 10,000 years before the coming of the emperor. Uh, they're the only ones completely unaffected by any of this. The only ones who, who benefited fundamentally benefited from the forest heresy. Uh, so that's why I believe, just like in the Dune, they are the secret orchestrators of the heresy so that they could continue their existence. That's what I've said. So four years later, it's another video explaining it. Everything that I see in the books continues to reinforce this. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, oh! The only other thing I'm going to add is that they're going to keep on with this um, Avengers Endgame meme that, you know, Horus is going to Doctor Strange this. He, he walked the Obsidian Path, went through his 14, relived uh, the Horus Heresy, you know, 14 million times. And only in one outcome was he able to defeat the Emperor. And how was he able to do that? The only way, and this is another popular meme, the only way he could win was by losing. Circa uh, Neo in the Matrix, uh, you know, dusting away in the Avengers. Um, even Paul Atreides needed to die 
to free humanity um, from, from in, in the end. He, need, he needed to be discredited and be killed. <sighs> Even his son, uh, Junior, needed to disappear off into the desert. So the emperor will need to die, and Horus needed to die in order to win. Well, how does he win then? He possesses Abaddon. I believe that a splinter, uh, Horus found out that all of, his in all of these futures, there was no way that his spear tip attack on Terra would defeat the Emperor, so that he needed more time, which is the one thing he didn't have. The one thing he didn't have in all of his plans is he didn't have all the time to figure out a way to defeat the Emperor. He had one shot, he needed to go there, he needed to do that. After walking the obsidian path, he found out that that was an impossibility, so he needed time. The one he's gonna get that time, he's gonna let the Emperor kill him. He's going to then possess, in part, Abaddon, and Abaddon is going to become this Shadow of Horus, which now has 10,000 years, well actually 50 to 60 years in the Eye of Terra, to plan out this elaborate scheme to defeat the Emperor. Uh, yeah, because Abaddon as a character was never particularly planning. He was always impulsive, rush in first, think never. And then somehow, after the death of Horus, becomes this incredibly patient, meticulous planner. Where did this 180 degree change in personality come from? Hmm, well, it hints that when Horus died, there was this huge psychic scream that went through all of it and it just drove him insane, batshit insane. Well, it could have driven him batshit insane. It could also be that he was possessed in part by Horus, which gives Horus the time to plan. And that's where this strategic genius, Abaddon the Spoiler, comes from. It also explains why one of the first things this new Abaddon does is hunt down all the clones of Horus and personally kills every single one. <sighs> I'm not going to make a long video series like LFS or text-to-speech guy, but that, if I was going to, would be how I mansplain the future of 40K. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye. <laughs>